Hello and welcome to Wednesday in the Word with Roger and Cheryl. We are so delighted you tuned in today. And uh, we hope you'll get your Bible and your notebook and get ready to take notes. We are still on, this is Lesson 10 of the Word of. And we've been talking about the Word of the Kingdom. We, I think, did we talk about Word of Faith yet? That was first. That was yes. first. We this talked about Word of word Faith. faith. Now we're talking about Word of the Kingdom. And I don't know how many, how many Cheryl will come up with here, but I'm going to tell you, uh, it's powerful, and uh, last last uh, time it was hard to stop because we're talking about uh, Isaiah six and the the, um, the, glory, of the glory of the Lord and how that uh, seraphim were crying holy, holy, holy one to another, demonstrating the 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 glory that we're the holiness that we're supposed to call forth in in each other, and uh, that that'll that'll preach. But we're going to uh, move on with our lessons. And uh, let's pray before Cheryl jumps in here and starts. And uh, we are going to uh, believe God that God touches you today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for every man, woman, boy, and girl that's listening. We thank you, Father, for the power of God that goes forth to touch them. God, if there be one listening that don't know you, we yet thank you, God, that this is their opportunity to call on the name of the Lord. Because you said if you call on the name of the Lord, uh, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. And God, I ask you, Lord, uh, draw all men unto you today. And God, we thank you, Lord, uh, God, that you've already drawn our condemnation uh, unto you. And God, you you are giving uh, us righteousness and holiness in exchange. I thank you, Father, for it, that you're still the healer today. And God, you said you send your word and heal them. So as the word goes forth today, healing power thank will go you. forth over these airways, uh, through this network, through the internet. And God, we thank you, Lord, that you're doing it uh, in the midst of your church. God, I praise you for it. Uh, and God, we thank you, Lord, that let your anointing be upon us today on Cheryl and, and, and Roger. God, as we open our mouth, God, let your anointing be upon us. Use the words of our lips. God, that, that your uh, anointing may go forth to change lives and to help people come into a higher place of glory in you in the mighty name of Jesus. We praise you. Amen. Well, Cheryl, looking forward to it. Let's jump right in. All right. Well, we finished last week's lesson talking about the holiness, as Roger said, and the seraphim, that, the vision that Isaiah had. So, um, it's, it's very important that we understand the nature of the king. Amen. And so, and what we read about and learned about in Isaiah, that God's a holy God. Now, Roger sa has said something, I guess he's probably known it for a long time, but he preached a sermon a few years ago, and in that sermon, he talked about where the scripture says, be ye holy. And growing up as a child, you know, we were taught we had to dress a certain way and look a certain way and we couldn't do certain things to be holy. And as a result of the way it was taught, it's, it was an impossibility. I mean, as a young girl and growing into a teenager and eventually a young adult, I just thought, we can't ever please this God. Mm -hmm. I mean... Why would I want to serve a God that's just so mean and we can't ever attain to his standards? Well, Roger said in this sermon, Be ye holy is like when God said, Let there be light, and light came. Well, that's exactly what happens with holiness. When the scripture says, Be ye holy, and I, I think Jesus said those words, Be ye holy as I am holy. Mm -hmm. I know Peter repeats some of that in his, um, his books, but it's like, it's the same power. Be ye holy. All right, now I'm holy. Now, that Jesus didn't just say that without providing that. How did he provide that? When he went to the cross and took all of our sins, and uh, Corinthians, Paul wrote that he became sin. Jesus didn't know any sin. He, he never did sin. 
And so he had to take the sins of humanity in his own being in order to know what sin was. And of course, at that point, he said, he realized that he wasn't feeling the presence of his father anymore. And, and he, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he had received all the sins of humanity. So Corinthians tells us that he became sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So when we are born again, as we've talked about in many lessons, we're brought into the kingdom as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Now we begin our journey and our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the word Lord means supreme authority. Yeah. So we've given him our life and said, you will be the supreme authority in my life and I will obey you if you will instruct me. I will do what you instruct me. And we, we make that exchange. We receive what Jesus did. He's already taken the other part. So when we've made this exchange, it's very important that we understand and believe that we are loved by God and that he loves us individually. He loves us as the body of Christ. He loves us just as a human being. God's not angry with humanity. If you hear preachers saying that, you need to, well, you need to close your ears to it, but you may need to find a new church because that's not what the scripture teaches. The world is to be reconciled to God. God's already taken care of things on his end. He's Amen. no longer mad at anybody. Or, you know, he, the scripture says he's not holding our sins against us. So that kind of thinking has to go. And it has to go if we're going to truly believe that God loves us. Because as long as we think that God's hanging something over our head... And waiting on us to mess up. We don't know the love of God. We don't know the love of the Father. You can read about those things in the first, second, and third books of John. Talk a lot about love. Alright, so anyhow. Um, what we must do. We must not be afraid of His holiness. Amen. See, some churches and preachers and so forth have made God's holiness so mountainous like it's this mystic mysterious thing or you know like I said earlier it's this thing we can't ever live up to well let's look at this thing called holiness all right so here we go <laughs> first of all holiness is a beautiful thing and he, he brings us into this holiness. So let's look at the definition of holiness. Holy, as in Isaiah 6, is taken from two words that mean pure and devoted. Two phrases, I really should say. Pure and devoted. Yeah. And the other phrase is the most holy and the most pure. All right. So let's put this in context. Um, well... Let's look at it this way. I wouldn't want to be a human that's impure or undevoted. What if I wasn't devoted to Roger in our marriage? That means I could just go out and have an affair with some other person. Or in this day and time, some people don't even do it with the opposite sex. So, you know, this is a serious thing. I don't want to be pure and undevoted. I love Roger. I adore Roger. I think he's the greatest thing that's ever happened to my life besides well, Jesus you. Christ <laughs> and uh, my children. But um, the thing about it is, is I want to be devoted to him. And I am. I, I'm, when I made that commitment, when we were joined in holy matrimony, Amen. 
That was my commitment, to be devoted to him. From now and as we live on into everlasting life. So, I wouldn't want to be impure, undevoted. If, if a person does not realize this thing about holiness, see, it leaves room for deception. It leaves room for deceit. It leaves room for things to creep in that are unholy, that are impure. So understanding holiness is very important because you don't want somebody to be that way to you. Not if you're a sane human being. You don't want somebody mistreating you. You don't want your spouse running out or your boyfriend going off when you're not around and uh, or girlfriend or whatever going with other people. Um, that, of course, is not a bond as strong as marriage by any stretch of the imagination. But it's just, you know, it's the idea to treat someone else with respect and don't treat them in a way that you wouldn't be treated. Jesus said that, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. All right, so that's a minor part of holiness. Colossians 3.12 says, Now, this is Paul and he's writing to the church. Which means, if you are a Christian, he's writing to you. He's writing to me. When I read the scriptures, I like to interject my name anywhere it's talking about the church, the body of Christ, a Christian, a person of God. I put my name in there and personalize it because then it makes me think about it. What, what is this really saying about me, Cheryl Hutchins? So Colossians 3, 2, Cheryl, put on therefore, as the elect of God, now think about that, the elect of God, that means a special selection has been made of you and me, that God gave us an invitation and we accepted it, holy and beloved, put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. Now, Paul had come to this revelation of the holiness of God and the holiness of himself and the holiness of the body of Christ. And that's an amazing thing when you stop to think about the fact that Paul was a murderer. I mean, Jesus said, if you think it in your heart, you've already done it. He got papers to go out and try to kill the Christians because he thought that they were against the true God and that the God he knew, these Christians were trying to make some other God. So when he said that I'm holy and beloved, you're holy and beloved. You're loved of God. You're loved by the body of Christ. In the eyes of the Almighty God, who is our Father, we are so beloved. If we could only get the depths more and more and more deeper depths of believing and understanding how beloved we are of God. You're just so loved of God. All right. Then he gives us instruction. We're to be merciful. We're to be kind. We're to have a humble mind, not thinking that we're better than everybody else. And we all probably have had little times when we've thought these things or been unkind or whatever. But when we come and we become a part of the kingdom of God, this is when the Holy Spirit begins to bring the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And we begin to change from all of those things. They don't have the hold on us like they used to. All right, and meekness and long-suffering. So these are attributes that are part of someone who is holy and, well, let me say it this way. These are attributes of someone who knows that it's, who's, it's come deep within the know.
Peter of Shoka, Peter of Tinley, are pre-signs, pure and devoted, the most holy and most pure brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. See, we're already that way because of the blood of Jesus Christ and receiving his righteousness. And we have a heavenly calling. We're not supposed to wallow down here in the earth with every thing that comes along and every wind of doctrine and all this confusion and discord and things of that. We have a heavenly calling. And this heavenly calling came from God himself. Amen. Paul said, the elect of God, holy and beloved. God chose us. Jesus said, I chose you. You didn't choose your, Amen. you know, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Now, we, we've got to believe that. Amen. There's a reason God chose us. He saw something in our hearts that desired God in our deep heart of hearts. And so now we are called holy brethren. Peter states it this way in 1 Peter 2, 5. You also, as lively stones, make note that that's not dead stones. Amen. We are lively stones. Are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. And here's why we are a holy priesthood. A pure and devoted, most holy and most pure priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Paul also tells us along these lines in Romans 12 that we're to offer our body a living Amen. sacrifice. The death has already happened. Amen. Jesus gave his life for our death. So now God's looking for living sacrifices. You know, if you're depressed and down in the dumps all the time and all you can do is think about your problems, which will bring more problems, talk about your problems, which will bring more problems, or magnify the problem that you have, um, that's, that's not uh, being a living sacrifice. Those are dead words. And uh, they bring forth death. We talked about that in one or two lessons ago. So anyhow, we are a holy priesthood, and that is our responsibility now to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And earlier in one of the lessons, we talked about uh, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And one reason for that, because we're talking about holiness now, and that the, the body of Christ has been made holy through the blood of Jesus Christ. So I want to contrast this a little bit. Um, the kingdom of God operates by love. Amen. Now the word unrighteousness means unjust, by extension wicked, treacherous, Heathen. <laughs> you know, sometimes we joke and say, well, I'm just a heathen. <laughs> well, we're not really, but I understand sometimes it is just a joke. But the thing about it is, is unrighteous is so opposite of righteousness and holiness. And, um, you know, truly we don't want to be unrighteous and unholy. Not if you know anything about God. He's such a loving Father. He is such a good, good Father. It's not just a song we sing about Him being a good, good Father. This is a reality that must be established in us. See, we're talking about the kingdom of God being established inside Amen. of us. Thank you, Father. So these things are part of being established in the kingdom of God. Um, you know what? We don't look at every mistake we made. There's a whole real, real big difference in my thinking between a mistake because you're immature and somebody who's just continuing on in sin. In fact, if you read 
the scriptures in First John in the Amplified Bible, it will say that, continuing on, something along those lines. It uses different words. But the point of it is, is if your heart is toward God, don't look at everything that you think you do wrong. I talked, I said that at the end of our last lesson, but it's so, somehow it's so strong in me that somebody's thinking that way. Stop it. Everything Amen. you do is not wrong. You know, if you can receive this, there were trees in the garden. Two trees are pronounced in the book of Genesis. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But there were still other trees in the garden. Yeah. Other trees are not necessarily bad. The scripture equates trees with people. Now think about this yeah. for a minute. So Spirit. there are some things that are just mistakes in life. Um, the Lord used that particular thought with me when he was teaching me something about we, we don't really have television, but we do watch on our phones sometimes on YouTube. And we happen to be watching The Big Valley right now, which was done back in the 60s. See, for years, years and years, I didn't have a TV, had no interest in it, so I missed all those good old shows back then. But I, I was thinking about that, and I, not about the Big Valley, but several, a year or so ago, I was thinking about, you know, movies and different things like that. And that's how God spoke to me. He said, there were other trees in the garden, and they weren't bad. Yeah. You know, they weren't bad. Now, there are horrific, horrifying things in this day and time on television and in the movies and things like that that are terribly sinful and unrighteous. But then there are some things that were just morally good. You know, once upon a time in the United States of America, which is where we live, people were just morally good. And many, most, if not, I mean, there were always drunk, drunkards and, you know, things that were wrong because we were born into sin and not everybody has been to church and heard the gospel or been on a street meeting or in a tent meeting. So the point is, though, that everything is not bad. When we're led by the Spirit, we know the checks of the Holy Spirit. We know when he says, not this, so we, not this. Mm -hmm. We, not this. And, um, all right, so, let me see how to wind this up, because we're getting close to time out. Um, we, I have stressed several times that uh, we have to believe that God loves us. So I want to read 1 John four sixteen, And it says, And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. The kingdom of God is ruled by the royal law of love because God is love. He is where you see God in the Bible, you could replace that with love, whatever it's talk about. You know, love suffers long and is kind. You can substitute with God is love and suffers long and is kind. And it would still be the same thing and it would be the truth. But here's the thing. It says, we have known and believed. Sometimes... You have to make a determination by your will, by your decision-making processes. I choose to believe God loves me. I don't care what I hear that's contrary to that. I don't care what emotions I have contrary to that. I choose to believe God loves me. Me. Myself. Me. Amen. And as you stand firm in that, God is going to let you know that that's really the truth. Your emotions will come into alignment. All of a sudden, your thoughts will be different. And you'll come to genuinely know that God loves you personally. 
You're his delight. He's not ashamed of you. Jeremiah told us he loves us with an everlasting love. He doesn't love us today and not love us tomorrow. Jesus Christ the same yesterday in the first covenant. Today, right now, in this present day, and forever. And it's time to go. I need to give Roger a chance. So take it away, Mr. I want to go back just for a moment. This has been an excellent lesson, Cheryl. And, but I want to go back just for a moment to the part where you were talking about uh, where Jesus said, Be ye holy. And the, if you actually look at that, uh, He's saying, Be holy. Uh, just like He said, Light be. And one thing I want to point out on, on that, there had, when it, whenever God said in the beginning, let there be light, or actually what he said is light be. Mm -hmm. And so light had never been before. This was creation. So how did light know how to be light? It had to come out of God. And just like I hear somebody saying, uh, I don't know how to be holy. Because we've heard it through religious filters so much that we think, that if I don't do it a certain way, see, it's not it's not about a religious a, a opinion. It's about do you receive what God said? And when He said light, God said light be. Light did what the nature of light is. It expelled mm -hmm. darkness. That's good. And so whenever He says, "Be ye holy," and we receive that word then our na the nature of holy begins to operate in us. Now we can't look at every little deed we do and every little thing that happens and say, well, we lose that holiness. You know, we can go into a, into an unlighted room and shut the door while it's in the middle of the day and all of a sudden uh, darkness will, will be dominating that room, but that didn't mean uh, the light quit being. And just like whenever we come into uh, into a place, sometimes whenever darkness tries to come back, we just have to remember. He said, "Be holy." So in my nature now yes. is it, the, it's natured in me now because of what he said, because of what he did, not because of what I'm doing, because of what he did. It's natured in me to be holy. The grace of God's working in me, and holiness is working in me. Mm -hmm. And I want to say one thing to you as we go off. Uh, the air today, and I want to say, uh, lift up your hands, <laughs> holy. holy. I declare holy. holiness working in you today, and I have the authority and the word of God to do that, not just as a prophet of God, but as a believer. You have the authority to speak into your home and say, children, holy. And let's, let's believe God it, that it's coming to pass. Father, we thank you today, God, that you let us go forth in the power of your word, in the power of holiness, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, lesson 11 next week. Be looking for it, and we're going to continue on. God bless.